I do not remember those shows at all. Of course, we have people from this community who have done well on game shows. Yes, we have. Right? Yes, Jeopardy. indeed. Jeopardy. Bob Fleener. Uh, there was somebody else around here. Was it Rod? Um, who was on Jeopardy as well? Um... Herb's Herb son Snyder Rob Rob Rob, Rob Snyder was, was he really? Was he on, I, I don't, I don't remember. remember. Oh no, he that. was on the uh, singing show, okay. like okay. American Idol. Yeah, okay. he was he was on that or some, something to that effect. I think it was. I'm sure somebody here. Um, you will, get that? Will recognize and will tell us. <laughs> yeah, it'll be in our comment section. Yeah, the audience is on their game today. They're sharp. We kept them sharp with that obscure game from 83 to 86, <laughs> Press Your Luck. Via, yeah. via telephone, Jason Elfman from Americans for Prosperity, West Virginia. Jason, good morning to you, sir. Hey, Rob, good morning. Uh, you're you're, you're uh, freaking me out a little bit, man. We're, uh, I, I have a reoccurring nightmare about being on a game show. So yeah. that's, uh, that was all unnerving to me. Is it that you're on a game show and you don't know any of the answers? Yeah, I mean it's it's pretty much that. Show, so. <laughs> it's a stress. You're throwing you're throwing me off my game right off the bat here. It's a stress stream, right? What what game show do you have your nightmares about being on and not knowing any answers? It's nebulous. It's nebulous. It's it's a generic game show, but in any event, you're not spinning a wheel or anything or turning turning panels around, though, right? I don't think so. Also, I don't remember the game show that uh, that you were referencing there. You're so too young, in, man. In the category of today, I learned no whammies. No whammy. No whammy. <laughs> whammy. How, how old are you, Jason? I'm 34. Okay, yeah, so this show was on like 40 years ago. You can only catch it in like replays on like the Game Show Network or something like that probably. Before my time. Way before your time, dude. But you do know Wheel of Fortune. I do indeed. <laughs> oh, jeez. Here we go. Do you, do you want to say anything about that, Maria? I, no, no. Let's just go on. Uh, Let's let Jason. You know, I don't I, – I haven't had stress dreams in a little while. But yesterday, when we got done with football practice, I was so tired. When I came home, I just sat down on the couch, and the next thing you know, I'm out. Okay. And it, I wake up at 6.15. Well, practice tonight has been moved to the evening at 6 o'clock. So I wake up. The clock says 6.15. I'm so out of it. I'm thinking, oh, no, I slept through football practice Thursday <laughs> night. I wake up and start panicking. I'm yelling to my wife, I got practice today, right? I got practice today. She's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm totally oblivious thinking that I slept all the way yeah, through to the next yeah. day. My recurring anxiety dream um, is I'm walking through the campus um, of WVU, the old area, like Martin Hall, which is the journalism school, and I'm stark naked. <laughs> I wake up still. This is 45 years. And, you know, it's a pretty easy yeah. understanding of what happened. I was not prepared for something. Sure. So instead, now I wake up and I'm just like, what are you doing? I'm like, so I've got, yeah. Jason, so. can you top that one? <laughs> I was just about to say that. That's way worse than mine. So. It, 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 it is. It's scary. Imagine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've revealed a little too much today. Yeah, yeah. Let's move on. You Jason. You definitely created some visuals. There's no doubt no, about no, that. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, uh, Jason, let's talk about this legislature. Uh, they had an opportunity. Uh, the governor uh, called them to think about a 9% tax cut instead of a 4% tax cut. That's not going to happen, at least not now. And it seems like there's no appetite for it throughout the remainder of the year as from the people that we have been interviewing. you have any thoughts on this personal income tax cut that is going to be at least 4%, but maybe just 4%? Well, I think that on, on the whole, it's great that we are in a position where we're debating whether by how much to cut taxes as opposed to whether we should or not. Um, so that is indicative of a, a, a good legislative culture to have. Um, and I think one of the things that is we're benefited by, obviously, is that, you know, the tax cuts are, are baked in, to, so to speak, right? In the last bill that they passed where, you know, they cut taxes by a historic amount, um, you know, nearly, nearly a quarter of the income tax. They also provided provisions where if we meet certain economic conditions, um, we'll, we'll go ahead and continue phasing out the income tax. So, I mean, it's one of those things where um, we're guaranteed tax cuts into the future and returning taxpayer money to to people's pockets especially mm -hmm. in a time where uh, you know folks are facing the bite of inflation from Bidenomics and you know really some folks are having a really tough time making ends meet it's great for them to be able to get some of those dollars back however however I will say that what we would like to see 
as lawmakers begin to look at state spending. Um, and as you know, Rob, uh, we're a grassroots-driven organization at Americans for Prosperity, and really no other organization in the country is doing the kind of work that we're doing, certainly in West Virginia, going door-to-door and with our activists and staff to, to have conversations about policy with West, with, with West Virginians. Um, since May, since after the primary, we've, we've attempted to talk to over 35,000 West Virginians at their doorstep, and we've spoken with roughly 10% of those folks, and, and where that comes into play, 80% of individuals that we, we had the opportunity to speak with said that lawmakers should rein in state spending, return as many dollars as possible to taxpayers, and significantly grow the economy in order to meet the, the top spending priorities such as uh, education, roads, and social services, over 80%. Can we agree that this legislature over the last several years has attempted to do that with flatline budgeting and the expansion of companies moving into the state? And tax cuts. I think cuts. they certainly have. I think they certainly have. Well, you have to create the conditions for economic prosperity. You, you've got to be a state that is welcoming to business to come in, that um, you know have the, the policies on the books that we are know are proven uh, to provide for human flourishing. And, and lawmakers have certainly taken ample steps toward that, and we'd like to see them double down on that approach. Bill? Yeah, uh, Jason, I frequently hear we need to reduce uh, uh, government spending. Uh, but where the uh, uh, tire meets the road is what are you talking about? Do you have certain agencies, certain programs that you would, uh, that you would advocate for either reducing or eliminating <laughs> specific ones? Well, I think that when it comes to state spending, holding a flatline budget or as close to flat as possible based on population growth and inflation, um, that, that provides you a mean by, means by which to, without cutting government, to rein in spending. And lawmakers have, have done a good job of that over the last couple of years. Um, and I, I, actually, I, I want to address something that I said last time I was on the show. Uh, I, I erroneously said that we would have, for the first time, uh, a day one Republican governor with a supermajority uh, in Patrick Morrissey, assuming that he's elected in November, uh, for the first time since Prohibition. The thing I forgot to mention about that, um, a first term day one Republican governor for the first time with a supermajority Republican legislature since Prohibition. Um, and so I think that opportunity given the stakes of that, right? That's pretty historic. We've got an opportunity to really reimagine how government operates and functions on the whole, right? Um, we have not had, I think, a great opportunity to, to do that, uh, given the, the personnel uh, elected to office. And so this will be the first time that uh, really conservative, conservatives in the state have, um, I think, again, a good opportunity to be introspective when it comes to how we govern. And so they should be taking a look at all the facets of government and, and wondering why we do things the way we do, because oftentimes, and I find the, the most, uh, you know, the phrase that draws the most ire from me when I, when I hear bureaucrats say it is, well, we've always done it this way. Well, maybe we shouldn't do it that way. So we've got an opportunity to, to, to check our priors on that. Yeah, but you, you've avoided my question, uh, and what I'm hearing is that the flatline budget has been very successful. You have not presented any other areas of uh, that we could reduce spending, so could I interpret from that just more the same in the future? Well, I think certainly ad adherence to fiscal responsibility is something that we would definitely appreciate lawmakers to do. But I think what, I, what I'm getting at, Bill, is that we have a more grand opportunity uh, than to just, you know, take a, an approach that's, you know, this thing or that thing. We, we have an opportunity to fundamentally overhaul and, and reimagine how we govern in this state. Yeah. And so I think that that is a, a much more broad discussion that, frankly, we've got to get down into the weeds of – the budget uh, and the practical functionality of government, and I think that's a discussion that we've we've got to have to to turn over the stones to see exactly where we need to make changes. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, what role do you see that AFP would uh, would play in this overall assessment of where we are and where we should be going? 
Well, certainly, uh, we we like to view ourselves as as a conduit between um, citizens and their lawmakers. And so, again, as we're out there talking to folks, when when asked what the more, most important issue uh, to, to the citizen was, 52% of people said taxes and spending, uh, followed by 26% that said health care issues, 17% said K-12 through education, and 5% said regulatory reform. And so what, what we endeavor to do uh, as a policy organization that's grassroots-driven is to present solutions to lawmakers that we know are, are proven examples of how to uh, make the state a better place to live, work, and raise a family. Maria. So, Jason, we just had Lisa Henry um, in studio with us. Uh, we talked very briefly uh, about the um, combination of AFT and the WVEA. Um, you know, uh, the the teachers groups um, have have clamored for a long time, obviously for pay raises, for additional support. Um, and not just teachers. We're talking about, you know, um, DHHR and and prisons. And um, so, where do you draw the line? And when um, when we're doing well, do you is that the time to continue to cut back? Some would argue that maybe we aren't doing well. Um, you know, just my question there leads to how that how how you see that? Um, are there agencies that need overhauls, more funding, less funding? Um, what do you think? Well, I'm glad that you bring education up because I think that what we've seen is a trend across the country where you continue to see enrollment go down um, or be stagnant in some states. Uh, our, our example in West Virginia is that enrollment has continued to, to go down um, over, over the years. What, what we also see, though, is an increase in education funding. Um, and so a lot of that, we call it staffing surge, right? There's, there's a significant amount of dollars that are going toward additional staff for a dwindling education population, i.e. the enrollment of kids at schools. Um, and, you know, I think since 1993, West Virginia's student population has declined by nearly 20%. Um, but staffing's increased by 8%, right? Um, that, that trend holds for surrounding states, and I think our point is that um, the K-12 through education system should not be a, a jobs program for adults. It's about educating kids, right? So to some extent, we've got to, we've got to uh, do a better job of getting those resources into classrooms and to teachers instead of, instead of um, bureaucracy based at Charleston. Our guest is Jason Husband, husband yeah, Huffman, <laughs> state director. He is a husband, a state director of Americans for Prosperity. In fact, that picture that we show on screen of him is his you know, wedding day picture. So, Jason, yeah. in, in, in West Virginia, uh, we have a child crisis, both child care, uh, child high, uh, health. We have a huge drug problem. A report was just given to the uh, West Virginia legislature earlier this week during the interim session. And then that report showed 17,000 babies are born each year in West Virginia on average, and 2,500 of those have already been exposed to drugs in the womb before they are born. This creates an educational situation in the state which requires more special instructors, more special ed, and more behavioral issues. We heard that from guests we had earlier this week, which requires more and more money. And these, this is a lot of money that it takes in regards to educating these kids, right? So I'm as in favor of tax cuts as the next guy, but in a state that has so many social issues, how do you continue to justify cutting more taxes if you're not raising at least that amount in revenues each year? Rob, did I lose you? Did you lose? Can you hear me? I guess we lost Jason. Jason needs to call back. <laughs> I, guess, I guess we did lose Jason. That's too bad. I thought it was a good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good question. <laughs> what was the question, Rob? <laughs> so, 
ban- banter amongst yourselves while I text Jason to call us back here. So, uh, Jason, I'll just hit him with a quick note here to call us back because he's been disconnected. Call back or bark if I misspelled that there. All right. Well, th- those are the issues. We had guests on this week who have talked about this. Right, and this, this right. The state needs a lot of spending in certain areas and uh, hopefully we're providing it i don't know that we are in for where are we with west virginia first the first foundation yes be a great question for matt harvey yeah i i know there's a lot of planning and i'm jason is back by the way okay good jason how much of that question did you actually get to hear I got the first half. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to pull a Joe Manchin on you and get a <laughs> question and hang up. Uh, no, I, just, I got disconnected oh, there. But. I'm told there was a video blip, but I don't know that that would affect you via telephone. Uh, so, but okay. uh, Anyway, because our, our show is TV uh, live as well as radio live. So anyway, Jason, as I was saying, we have uh, a lot of situations with special education in this state. There was a report given to the... Uh, chamber earlier this week in which it said 17,000 new babies born in West Virginia each year. 2,500 of those are exposed to drug uh, drugs in the womb. Even before they get outside into the world, they're exposed to that in the womb. Uh, other people on our program this week testified to the fact that this creates additional education expenses and problems, including behavioral, uh, in the classrooms. So in a, in a state with a finite amount of revenues, how do you continue further justifying tax cuts and spending cuts when you have this huge issue with education and social welfare problems in West Virginia? Well, I think when you look at the tax cuts that have occurred, um, we're still having positive revenue stream, right? So what we've done is we've created the condition for growth. Partially, um, some of that is associated with the increase in consumer sales. Obviously, when inflation goes up, things cost more, and so your sales tax revenue collections will will be increased. Um, But two-pronged approach. First off, we continue to put money back into the pockets of West Virginians so that they can invest in their version of the American dream because we know that grows the economy. That that is a proven way to bring not only people and business to your state but to to better the lives of the people that are there, Um, letting them keep more of their hard-earned paychecks. So, one, we continue to grow the economy so that we can afford um, things like and I'm going to tell you an example of, uh, you know, there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to policy to some extent. And Texas faced a very similar problem uh, with regards to, um, you know, the, the epidemic of drug use that they faced in their state. So back in 2007, Rick Perry's governor of Texas. And basically they, they say to him, well, okay, you, you need to build some new prisons, governor, because we're running out of space. And he said, hold on a second, how much is that going to cost? They said billions. He said, okay, we, we've got to do something different because we can't continue this cycle of poverty and recidivism. And so Governor Perry said, let's just stick uh, treatment beds, thousands and thousands of treatment beds in every jail and prison that we have. And that was in 2007. Since then, since they, they did that along with a slew of other, uh, what we would consider to be smart criminal justice reforms, they've closed 11 adult prisons. They have, despite uh, the border crisis, some of the the safest streets since the the 1950s. So the solutions are out there. Um, And when we talk about fiscal responsibility, we want to be able to fund those solutions that we know work. Um, Because just throwing money at a problem and the system that we've built to deal with it, not not functioning like it should, is no solution at all. Yes, but but just economy, but just we, cutting money, those. but Jason, just cutting money from the funding for the purpose of cutting money from funding isn't part of the solution either. It's got to be purposeful. Well, sure, yeah, and we've got to be purposeful with with regards to how we're we're spending dollars. Um, because again, there, I think there's a lot of folks that would advocate for more spending um, for certain issues, but if the systems that we have in place that we're we're utilizing those dollars towards are ineffective. Um, we're not leveraging the taxpayer dollars to the to their highest and best use. Does that make sense? It does, William. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This is. Uh, it sounds to me like a. Uh, uh, it's euphoria. Yes, a Pandora and in Pandora's box at the same time. Uh, what you're proposing is not new. We hear this all the time. We're going to come in. We're going to analyze. We're going to revamp. But yet it all comes back to where we were before. Uh, 
I'm I'm intrigued your thought about when uh, with the new government coming in that we're going to do a, a massive examination uh, and then we take a course of action from this massive examination. Uh, I, the the proof's going to be in the pudding. How you can do the analysis to meet the many many needs that we have uh, and still do this magic thing, waving the wand and reducing government. It, it's, there, it's, it's highly complex, and I have not heard any real answers to it yet. You seem skeptical, Bill. I'm, I'm skeptical very much so, yes. He's a skeptic. He's a skeptic. Well, actually, basically, I'm not. Right I'm off. optimistic. Well, but uh, yeah. we, we can all agree that a dollar wasted by government is a dollar that shouldn't be wasted. We can all start there. We Amen. can. We can. Uh, but we we have some trouble to find what is wasted. Uh, if it's fraud and abuse, it's wasted. No question about it. But what in one person's mind is a useful expenditure of money in another person's mind it's wasteful and that's well, why the crux of the question and i do remember saying to uh charles trump who was a big advocate of you know the the reconfiguration of dhhr mm -hmm. into three and i'm like how do we get this way i mean analysis paralysis whatever you want to call it um it takes us a long time to get from point a to point b but yet the solutions take an even longer time. Jason, can we agree that the Republican majority has kept a good lid on spending in their time as compared to the Democratic majority that preceded them? Or is that not correct in your eyes? Uh, I, I think that's, that's certainly accurate. Um, and, and also, you know, I would just say, when you look at dollars and cents, and revenue for the state and revenue collections versus growth in GDP and, and growth of, of business and commerce, um, you, you can't really look at it statically. You've got to look at it from a dynamic perspective because these things change and policy doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? I mean, as long as lawmakers are focused on pro growth policy, we're going to continue to see growth in the state. And, and frankly, in a place where we're within, uh, you know, a 10 hour drive of 75% of the East Coast population, we're, we're in a great position, I think, to, to continue to grow economically. Um, you know, we've seen innovations in, in education uh, and in our tax structure, and that is drawing people to the state. And so we can't have the social safety net for the truly vulnerable without growing the economy. They, they just don't compute. You can't draw blood from a turnip or a stone, as mm -hmm. granddaddy would say. So we've got to see that growth. Um, and I understand the, the frustration that some people have with uh, – you know, looking at tax cuts and saying, but these programs, but that's the point. We need to grow so that we can use uh, a higher revenue stream from that growth to, to afford the, the social safety net for the truly vulnerable that we want. And the state does have some economic growth. I think we would all like it to be more boisterous, uh, but... Uh, vigorous, yeah. Vigorous. But it's been pretty impressive. It has been. It yeah. has been. Agreed. Yeah, we have been enjoying revenue surpluses, hence the personal income tax cuts that have come over. Jason, I've got about 30 seconds. Tell our audience how they can find out more about Americans for Prosperity. I would take a look at wvpathway.com. That's where our legislative agenda is. And as always, appreciate you having me on. Yeah, and it's uh, our pleasure there. And we'll be talking with you more, especially as we get closer to Election Day. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Jason, have a great day. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason.